first question is going to be for Michelle and Joe. Um, I think, if I'm correct, you were working on your movie for 14 years, um, and you're in it, and your son is in it, and your son's best friend is in it. So um, I was going to ask, what's it like to, first of all, direct each other? And how did that um, screw up your family life? <laughs> no. And, uh, and we'll talk about Idris, your son, in a little bit, but start with that. Take that one. Um, so the first thing is that everybody knows your business. And any of you have seen the, the film, you know that we're going to argue a lot here and, and disagree. But we started this process, and we somehow didn't think we would be in it. It was about our, our children, and we were, we were going to look at diversity in a, in a rigorous private school. Um, and we realized during the first interview that we only got yes or no, or I'm hungry. And, and, and it became obvious to us over time that the film was actually about us as parents as much as our sons. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of directing each other, uh, it was very painful <laughs> at times. And I think the bigger thing, and I think we'll talk about uh, uh, Idris, is really balancing the parent hat with the filmmaker hat, um, both in terms of being portrayed but also in terms of what took priority in terms of understanding our son's needs, so. All right, so I'm gonna shoot it over to the QD team right now. Um, I guess uh, for both Zach and Ushio and Noriko, can you talk a little bit about, and Zach, you can go first, um, how your relationship with your subjects evolved from when you, uh, how you got to know the, about these people, and then where you are now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of the story of the movie, I think. I mean, the, it sort of started out um, more about their art, and specifically more about Ushio's art. Uh, I didn't know much about them before I met them. I um, was introduced by a friend, Patrick Burns, who's a photographer and journalist, and thought they would make a good subject for a short and um, I was just kind of immediately captivated by their faces and the environment that they lived in. They sort of live in this time warp that's harkened back to the early 70s downtown art scene that kind of fascinated me. And it was much, I was sort of the outsider, the voyeur looking in on a kind of bizarre existence. And so I just, I recorded everything. And, and uh, the process of making the film was sort of know, figuring out which aspects of their life interested me most and the ones that they were more hesitant to reveal, um, which, you know, slowly and slowly sort of unfolded, you know, in front of my camera and, and became, you know, the, the sort of core narrative of the film. And that's really Noriko's kind of journey to escape, um, you know, the sort of pressure of being the wife of a egotistical artist who uh, has has been the more famous of the two and, and really seeing Noriko's journey um, and her kind of evolving um, and our relationship really growing is kind of what made the film. I mean, my film, I guess, was five years in the making, um, so not quite the, the journey that Joe and Michelle went on, but certainly, a, you know, a long endeavor and these kinds of movies I think are, you know, you kind of have to wait, you kind of have to wait for things to change. If you're making an observational film, you're, you're dependent on the drama that comes out of your subject's life and that you can't create that. And, and uh, so, you know, it was really just a process of me becoming more and more invisible and, and then becoming more and more comfortable with me and then what you see in the film is kind of the result of the last few years where they were really comfortable with me and, and they were just sort of existing and not worrying about why I was there and, and I could kind of, you know, fluidly move in and out of, of their lives. And um, 
So yeah, I mean, that, this, I guess what I'm saying is the, the process of making the film is um, kind of, it is in a sense the, you know, the film itself. And Noriko, how did you feel about this guy coming into your house and uh, at first, and how do you feel about him now? Uh, in the beginning, I thought he was just a cameraman which helping his friend Patrick Burns. So, but uh, about two years later, Patrick left for his work. And then that, time, that was the first time I understood he was a director. And, uh, you know, he was a more intimate and quiet guy, but now changed. So it's not only we changed, but he himself changed. And uh, um, beginning, you know, he, uh, he and uh, Patrick asked me the, uh, you know, we had questions. He, they wanna film me the wake up, brush hair, and uh, do the morning, wake, uh, morning stretch. I felt, you know, what I was doing in the morning stretch, my shoulder get stiff because then. Uh, but, uh, you know, the time passed, so gradually his existence turning like the, uh, my everyday object, house object, like the rice cooker, I always say. And uh, or, uh, he doesn't do the mopping job, but uh, for me, the last, just the tall mopping was there. So uh, gradually I felt uh, not bothered. And it was, uh, and around that time, uh, my I and Ushio's two exhibition just happened. So he, I think he was lucky enough to capture that moment. And he came to uh, film while I was painting in a gallery. And he, uh, he was filming uh, before I, uh, under, under my leg. And uh, it wasn't comfortable, but while I was um, devoting myself for, for my art, so I ignored, but sometimes I have to kick him out because he questioned me too much, made me tired. But, <laughs> but you know, after, after, even after the, that moment, it took more time uh, to be finished. So maybe um, last, uh, last two, uh, beginning, uh, you know, when I felt so, uh, so stiff and tired, that wasn't a good moment, so he couldn't use that film. So now, it's, uh, after the film is finished, we have a more comfortable time. <laughs> Noriko, uh, for you, it must be interesting because having starting, started out as the more famous artist, um, were you pissed off at Zachary when the movie became, evolved into a way that it became, I would say, a bit more Nori, uh, Ushi, uh, Noriko's story and about your relationship as much as it is about your work? Uh, because, uh, uh, because that, is that for Ushio? Is that for Ushio? Huh? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. 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 I don't really mind that I turn into uh, uh, Noriko's story. Uh, from the beginning, um, if, Zach would, if Zach was trying to capture my art, uh, it's, uh, I thought that it would be impossible because my art is a little bit too crazy for film. So, <laughs> in boxing painting, audience. So when I do boxing paintings, um, the, the important part is uh, the audience. And uh, when Zach came, I thought he was one of the audience too. And uh, I tend to be very generous with my audience, so when Zach came, I, uh, I, uh, I, I even let him uh, take a shower, um, let him film me uh, taking shower and everything. And so in the end, the film became a huge success, so I'm very happy about it. Nice. <laughs> His reaction, though, when he first saw the film, he, you should talk about that because he wasn't okay with it being about Norco. 
あ小さな部屋であの出来上がったぞって見,見せられた時に僕は金管なんであのよく見えなかったんですけどものすごいがっかりしたりしました。あ、uh, so、first, first time I saw this film,、uh, the finished one,、um, uh, we were in a small room and then my eyes are bad, but、uh, when I saw what I saw,、um, I was actually disappointed. それはあの寒い真冬に外であのボクシングペインティングの撮影がスローモーションカメラであ,あったんですけどその時朝からまで裸で。あの12月にボカボカやって一番大事なフィルムだと思ったのにそれが全部カットされているのでえと一番最後にあのノルカ僕はぶん殴るとこだけしか採用されてないんで僕は非常にびっくりしました。So in this film, in a very very cold day in the winter,、um, I had my shirt off and、uh, we, we filmed outside doing the,、uh, my boxing painting. And、uh, in, a, in a final、uh, version of the film, all these footage they were cut out. And then when I, yeah, and what I saw,、uh, and the only surviving footage of that shoot was in the end when I,、uh, when, when you see that the Norco is punching me in the face. So beware, she's got a swift one too.、Uh, cool. All right,、uh, Michelle and Joe, and either one of you can answer this as I, I mentioned earlier.、Um, Your son Idris, as I mentioned before, and his best friend, at least at the time when they were growing up, Shayan, are, are, I guess, along with yourselves, the main subjects of your movie.、Um, how did those kids, did, what was their journey? Did they start off more gung ho to be like, do they feel like little movie stars? And then it became what? Finish the sentence and tell us about the journey on the way. Michelle's gonna go. <laughs>、uh, well, with the, I mean, in the same way that we realized that we had to be more involved in the film because there was a, a, one, a level of, of,、um, of uh, unfolding of story or unfolding of,、uh, of events in our relationships that couldn't all be articulated by the kids. In that same way, their level of investment.、Um, Evolved over the years. I think at the beginning, and also was different depending on the two boys. I mean, Idris was used to, since we are filmmakers, he was used to having camera around and working on films and production, so he was a little more familiar with the camera. Shayon was always extremely shy.、Um, but by the time middle school hit, it was like a, a pretty much, you know, by the end of middle school, it, it, there was this. Teenage situation or preteen situation where it was even less about the camera than just about the fact that, you know, they, wanted, they didn't want to be around their parents. He would growl so, every time we walked by him. Yeah. <laughs> so, what ended up happening is we figured out other strategies to kind of capture moments where we were removed, but where they could still be as spontaneous and transparent without us around. So, we worked with the cinematographers, DPs who were closer to them in age,、um, and that worked out. Well, in terms of the le- their comfort level. But I have to say, just in terms of our own involvement over this long period of time, we all had relationships with the cameras that evolved.、Um, there were periods that I wanted nothing to do with the film. There, and that was the moment when Joe was pushing me to be more out there.、Um, there were moments when the Summers family and Shayon went through some very deep, difficult moments、um, where we had to decide are we going to push back, are we going to pull back and wait until they're comfortable, or they were avoiding us. There were times when Idris, we would get to the school with the camera and he would slip out in the back door with his friends. And that was, that was, not, that was a, a shoot day that had to be you know,、uh, thrown to the wind. So our relationships evolved. The camera, it was a constant negotiation of the camera and its negotiation with us as, as, as filmmakers and our relationships with, with the schools as well was、um, another big, big factor in terms of their subjects. Yes, you can, what would you like to add? So, so you know, I was listening、uh, to the conversation earlier and, and it dawned on me this filmmaking process, this observational process, it, is a dance with trust, right? You have to develop. Trust with your characters, and, and, and that takes a long time. I, I don't know how Frederick Weissman does it in six weeks, but、uh, it took us 10 years. And, and, and you know, there were, there were points when everybody walked out of the film, 
and we had to renegotiate the relationship. And then it dawned on me that we had the same issues. In fact, at one point, uh, we went to see a therapist uh, so that our sense of vulnerability was uh, more in tune to what we needed. We, we, we realized that shooting the film with, a, with an event in mind, a graduation, um, a report card, uh, a basketball game was not working for us. And so, and then we developed the ability because that level of trust and vulnerability was developed, uh, that where we could actually capture something in a three-day period, no matter what was happening. Uh, and so, it took a long time to, to get there. Yeah, I mean, I think a prime example of that is really our interactions with Shion and his family, and, and uh, Shion's mother constantly questioning, well, are you going to portray my son the way you would portray your own son? And what does that, she, she asked that on multiple occasions when there was doubt. And that's when we had to turn the camera off. I mean, that was when we built, I mean, even before that, but it was about strengthening the sense of trust with each other and understanding that the friendship was just as important as the story and the process was just as important, if not more so. Because we were not gonna get the vulnerability we needed or the exposure we needed in terms of ourselves or them without that trust and understanding that we were invested in uh, telling a story that had complication and had complexity of, of, uh, of representation. And the way that works is, is when their, their son dies uh, and we turn off the camera, they ask to turn the camera back on. Um, one thing that both these films have in common, and correct me if you guys disagree, uh, is, well, for one thing, as we've heard today, they both took many years to fully come together, but it seems to me, after watching both your films, that you started out making this film, and you wound up with that film, and you both had the good sense to realize it and own that film that you didn't necessarily in, uh, set out to make. Would you say that's a fair estimation? It's right. Yeah. Yes. I. Yeah, I mean, I, I could, I could give an example of one thing. Please. Um, I remember early on, I, I mean, early on, I was interviewing Ushio and Noriko nonstop, and um, it was much more of this interrogation of, you know, me, the sort of investigator, and them, the subject, and that was more of the relationship. And I remember asking Noriko a few questions about their son, and I remember Noriko being, this was probably in the first two years, uh, a bit hesitant, and actually at one point turned the microphone off and asked that we not record this section. And, um, and then, you know, probably three years later, when the sort of, my method of making the film totally shifted to something not based in interviews and much more um, much more sort of, you know, trying to just catch moments in their life and having them basically investigate each other more than me investigate them and for me to observe that and, and to sort of, um, you know, draw complexities in their character that they were revealing to me, um, you know, sort of on their own volition as opposed to me, you know, sucking it out of them. Um, that the son's character sort of organically played out and in, in a scene or a few scenes um, that, you know, ultimately became, um, you know, much more of an honest and in a lot of ways more revealing depiction of the son and his relationship to the parents than I could have gotten out of the interview. And I also think Ushio and Noriko at that point, because of the trust and because they knew how invested I was in the project and how long and how many nights I'd spent at their house, didn't care what I was filming and, and weren't, you know, gonna say, stop now, um, you know, we don't want this in the film. It was just another thing. I was, everything was sort of treated with equal importance um, and I think they got that and so it became less about specifically what I was after um, and, and more about just, you know, this is life. Um, it was like uh, uh, the process of growing up, not us, not my son, but growing up of Zach himself. 
because uh, he, when he came, we, uh, we thought he, you know, he was tall, and the Caucasian faces more looks like more grown up than uh, we Asians. So I thought he was grown up, but not. Later we found out he was 24 when he was he was first time here. And, uh, you know, as a 24 years old, uh, he was naive and uh, dreaming of the future and dreaming the love and, uh, you know, life. But, uh, you know, we are so complex and uh, so many disappointments and uh, still few, uh, look at the future different ways than him. So it took, uh, took many years for him to understand. First, he interrogated me, you guys don't love each other? I said, why we love each other? We hate each other. <laughs> that, for him, it took five years. Of, still, he, he, I'm not sure he still understands or not. Love related to hate and hate related to love. If we don't love each other, we don't hate. Um, Ushio, if, uh, there, there are probably, I assume at least, a lot of filmmakers in the room. Um, if you had any advice to a filmmaker who has to come into the project's life, um, what advice would you give them to gain the kind of trust that it takes to wind up with a film like you guys have? Uh, this is a very difficult question, but one thing I can tell you is that uh, you should probably avoid uh, making artists as a, as a subject. それはあのチャンスがたくさんあって、あのザクのフィルムが成功したのは素晴らしいチャンスにたくさん恵まれたからで、これは偶然のことなんで、そういうものはなかなかあの計算ではできないから。<笑> So I consider um, there are a lot of luck factor uh, uh, in, in uh, success of a Zach's film, and then this is something that you can calculate. So, so the Noriko wa, ano, Noriko ga kono film no naka de mite ruto, boka seichou shi shi nai kedo, Noriko ga seichou shite ru tiyu, hen na ano kekka ni natta no ga kono eiga no seikou da to. So when you look at this film, uh, you might notice that uh, the the Noriko is the one who grew in the, within the story and not me. And I think that that's got something to do with the success of the film. But I believe it's a, Zach is growing, not me. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna open this up to uh, you guys, if you, anyone has any questions. Um, I guess we have mics on the side. So um, you can step up and uh, we'll start with this gentleman over here. Uh, <clears throat> I had a couple of questions. Uh, first was, uh, how many hours of footage did, uh, for each of the projects? And the second question, how was it to f shoot at Dalton, to the school? I I'm amazed that, a, that a, a, you know, a, a school of privilege and whatever would want to expose or, 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 or let you have access. Or maybe they didn't give you access, I don't really know. Did you, I haven't seen the movie yet. But I mean, did you shoot in the school itself or in classes or other kids? I mean, they usually put up all sorts of excuses to make it difficult uh, for you to, you know, uh, do it. How difficult was it to shoot at Dalton? Um, what we should say is that we want to be politically sensitive, that Dalton supports this film, that our film is not about Dalton because the same th points of view that we have in that environment. We could talk about the film industry, the fire department, uh, and public schools. That being said, uh, we shot at two schools. The, the releases came at the Benjamin Banneker High School, 800 releases in two days, signed. At Dalton, 13 years, well, just to say, in the same way, releases. yeah, I mean, it, with uh, Dalton, it was a yearly negotiation. Every beginning of school year was a negotiation about how much access we were going to have. 
and what we wanted to shoot and whether they were in agreement with it and how we would negotiate that with parents. And it persisted every year. And again, and I think as the years became, got, went further, as we reached high school and the stakes became higher around what kind of story were we gonna tell, there, more barriers were put up. But I have to say that we were persistent and I think by the time that arrived, they had already gotten many years of footage, you know, that was accepted, uh, that we had uh, had had access to. So um, uh, again, I think the trust came in. There was a level of trust and understanding that we were looking to make a complicated film, not a film, uh, not a gotcha film, and that it would it would expose the good and the bad and the warts of all of those involved around this issue of of uh, black male achievement in education. And so we understand the issues of, of white privilege. And we, when we took that on when we made this film. Uh, but over time, uh, this was a film in which the stakes for us as filmmakers, and we haven't described that, were very high. Our son was struggling. He was struggling academically, and he was struggling for uh, who he was. And, and we began to talk to other parents, and they couldn't help us because they were in so much pain over their own son struggling that uh, they couldn't reach out. So we, we, we toured the country. We spoke to anybody who would speak to us. So that's part of the filmmaking process. So as he's in tears and we have the camera on, then we have to decide, what do we do? And, uh, and we worked that out over time. Uh, and sometimes we did nothing. Uh, which what's, you have. what's your guesstimate of how many hours of footage you had? That was part 800. Of the 800. Wow. Uh, it, we became much more efficient uh, uh, towards the end. Uh, and because uh, everybody changes and everybody grows, but our DPs, they, our DPs grew, grew the fastest. I mean, if you can, first of all, we were the DP early on. And, but, but when our, the director of photography, but we noticed some amazing change in, in, in the way they shot and, and, and many times we couldn't be there because we would dis disturb the flow. And did you edit as you went along or did you edit all at once at the end? We edited uh, as we went along. There was a huge period of time where not much was edited, but we, we edited all along. And about three years off of the high school uh, um, graduation is when we started really more intensely organizing material. Exactly. And that helped inform you know, how we were going to shoot and what we were going to shoot you know, the last two years. So, so there were two parts of that. And I, I mean, this is very quick. Organization, we, we spent a year organizing footage. I mean, we have bins for, you know, uh, mice running across the room, uh, fronts of buildings. Uh, and, and then we decided, because we've made a few films, to, to, to bring in the best verite uh, editors that we could find and to wait and to have long discussions because it's an, it's an art form and everybody can't do it. And Zach, how about you? How many hours of footage did you say you have, and how did you deal with editing at all? Um, I think we had 300 hours, and then archival footage, um, you know, another, another 30 or 40 hours of archival footage, um, home videos. Um, and the editing process, um, yeah, I mean, I think I started editing. I would. I started editing the film and was basically submitting cuts for grant applications early on. And that was a big sort of impetus to start actually working on what would become some kind of finished movie. Um, and then the first grant I got, I hired an editor, um, and that was probably two years before we finished the movie. And they worked for a few months, and we had an assembly. And then I went back and shot a lot more, uh, much more sort of directed and specific. Um, and then a big process for us was trans, I mean, I had all of that material subtitled, so I don't, I'm not, I don't speak Japanese. Um, so yeah, I originally was looking for a, a Japanese speaking editor and, and 
had a had one, and then um, that didn't work out. So ended up finding another editor who was not a Japanese speaker either. So um, I basically ha hired an army of subtitlers, and we worked over you know a four or five month period to basically subtitle everything. Um, I mean. Minus some things we knew we weren't going to use, but a lot of footage. So that that took a long time. And then we spent another I spent about another year shooting and editing with the new editor um, until the final film was done. But it's very much this process of you know figuring out what you have and then going back and and shooting more and also sort of figuring out you know I mean we completely figured out the story in the edit um, and yeah I mean the editor obviously as you're alluding to, is such uh, an important piece of, I mean, the writer, the, you know, the brains behind how to assemble all of this material, um, especially when you're super close to it, as, you know, I was directing and DPing the project, so, you know, everything I thought was interesting wasn't everything that everyone else thought was interesting, so, um, crazily enough, and, uh, you know, so so I worked with a great editor very closely for almost a year and whittled it down. I'm going to go to this gentleman next, but if you're in the middle and you have a question, I know it's tough to get to these mics all the way to the side, so just raise your hand. I'll call on you, and if, if uh, I'll repeat the question to make sure everybody uh, hears it. But this gentleman right here. Uh, David, you used the term directing the subject, I think, early on, as, and it sort of raises with the subjects here to the extent the filmmakers were directing the subject or directing the actor, the tension between trying to get a performance out of your subject as a documentarian uh, and the performer or the subject giving you a performance that doesn't quite jive. Uh, and in the case of um, American Promise, you're directing your son. So it's an even more uh, loaded. I'm just curious about that um, tension uh, between attempting to get a performance from a subject or an actor. Michelle, Joe, you want to take that? Um, I, I, as we got better, we directed less because we knew it was it was providing the space uh, for them uh, that that was going to work for us, and, and you know. Another part of this filmmaking process that people don't discuss is that it's a communal thing. You know, if we, we have 300 credits on our film, right? And so uh, about four or five years into the process, people started calling and offering advice. We went to Sundance Composers Lab, right? And, and we were at uh, TAA. Uh, and so the New York filmmaking community took on this project and and they all had advice for for us but I remember at the composers lab uh, we were told to relax <laughs> and and uh, and and we we didn't know why we were at the composers lab it's like this is for, for musicians and we realized that when we got home uh, uh, the beauty of that is that we learned that we were, we didn't have to work so hard. And part of making a better film uh, was to be more vulnerable and, to, and more patient for it to come. So like fishing, you know, you, you're sitting there and, and you don't have to do anything, you know. The rod is, go, uh, is gonna, gonna, gonna jerk and, and then you can whine. And so that's, that's what happened. But also it happened with our entire team. Uh, from our DPs, our APs, uh, the transcribers, we, we, we developed a huge community. Of yeah, I mean, I think also in, I don't know about whether you can actually say directing an actor and directing a subject when you're talking about observational film, or in this case, self-reflexive hybrid kind of approach. It, the directing comes, I think, with the patience and with letting the camera just uh, capture the moments. And in this sense, I think the directing really comes in the editing. It comes 
after, once you've assembled all of that, when all of this material of the, 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 the uh, boring moments to the high points, to these other moments, to you know, uh, 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 portraying uh, uh, an aspect of uh, Joe's personality, uh, how does that balance out with another scene? Or that's where the directing happens uh, in, in this type of film. And it's, uh, it's a part of conversations with editors in terms of how are we gonna sculpt these different things and make them work in a way that's engaging but you have to have that raw material first. And the, 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 the directing part of that raw material is being able to be there in a way that's um, not necessarily fly on the wall, but being able to be there and capture the moments where trust has been established and people are, are exposed. So, so, so are you saying, and I'm, I'm gonna translate for it, the film is not real. And, and, and that's the controversial part about documentary filmmaking, that, that Oh, many times it's the juxtap juxtaposition, and, and p many people talk about how angry I am, and, am I in the film, and oh, I'm surprised, you, you know, you didn't, uh, and, and you were talking about some of the same issues in terms of how, what, what is on screen, and sometimes we need to be a little angrier for another scene to, to, to resonate in some way. But it sounds, uh, Michelle mentioned the word trust again. This is a word that keeps coming up here because we were talking about it earlier from the subject's point of view, uh, trusting you guys as filmmakers, but you also have to trust that your subjects, that you're going to wind up with something that people are going to want to see. And that's a big part of the process. Um, so yeah, just have, one thing on, oh, sure. on Joe's okay. point. I think it's great what he said that you actually start to direct less. Um, you know, I think early on, as I was saying, you know, it was much, so much more of an interrogation, so much more of like, I knew exactly what was fascinating about these characters and I was gonna get that out of them. And I knew it was going through the process of questioning and questioning and then it, be, you know, then it, it, it turned at some point and became so much more about, all right, let's just wait for the situation that will happen that will bring out aspects of their personalities that I'm most interested in. Like, what is it, you know, a, a day, you know, is it the day where Ushio, Ushio goes on a trip to Japan and returns home after a while? And you're, you're looking for a sense of, you know, did Noriko miss him? Which is a small thing, but it's, a, it's you know, you can't, you literally can't ask that question and get an honest answer. Um, so, it, you know, it was, it was patience and, uh, you know, uh, obviously building the trust, but also stepping back and allowing, you know, the space and and folk, you know, and, and figuring out what is it that's going to reveal the most honesty. Is it a look? You know, is it a glance or is it an answer to a question? And in, in my film, I wasn't getting answers that I felt like were for in the interviews that I felt like were being that you know where I was getting a sense of vulnerability or innocence or. Um, or honesty, it was, um, you know, it was this other method. And I think in every documentary, there's a different method of finding that. But you made up the story. That's while, true. While, I, while he was away to Japan, I, I didn't miss. I, I, I have more, I, I enjoy the silence of my studio. And uh, actually, I, that time, I don't go out much. But uh, you made up, I go to dancing to fulfill free, free my mind, or I go to walk the high day. That's not true, you made, you did, by editing, you made up. <laughs> you did rush to the door when you came home, though. People commented on that, Because, actually. you know, I'm, I'm at the end of the studio, and the <laughs> studio is big, I have to run, otherwise he's gonna ring, ring, ring. Uh, okay, we have time for a couple more, and then we have a couple more people here at the mic, so. Sure, this gentleman here. Hi. Um, oh, I think a lot of what you've been talking about uh, answers this, at least in part, as far as uh, time and patience, trust and editing is concerned. But um, I, I kind of appreciate uh, the suggestion the gentleman had about not choosing an artist uh, as a subject or participant. Um, and uh, my, my question is um, similar to the directing an actor or a subject, but um, did you encounter a lot of situations as directors where uh, the subjects or participants 
were giving creative input or, or giving direction themselves or basically saying, this is what we should do in this film. Um, and if so, how did you uh, sort of work with that? Hmm. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> well, it was, it was in our, uh, that's not the kind of film we make. I, I do recall uh, my son was at a party in Greenpoint. No, 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 let me just say this. One of our favorite scenes that's not in the film uh, is where our son stands up and attempts to curse us out because we wanted a happy moment in the family. This is not a happy moment. And, 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 and he refused to speak and he walked out. That was in an earlier cut. But, but re really we were trying to just observe uh, for the most part. I, I do recall, I don't know if this addresses your point, where he was at a party in Greenpoint and he looked up and there was a guy with a camera and, and everywhere he went the guy was following him around and then they were in the street trying to get a cab home and that same guy was following and he says, who is that? That's, that's your father's friend. And so that's the kind of thing we were, we were doing. We, we got a 17 year old from the Tribeca uh, film program uh, who agreed to film him and he could go in places where we, we couldn't go. So um, we, we really didn't demand things, but we were sneaky at times. And, and many times what we would do is ask them to film themselves. Our film opens with one of our characters shooting himself, talking about what it's like to be in a film for 14 years. Um, Noriko, did you tell Zach what should be in the movie? Um, at the beginning, uh, Zach, was, uh, Zach and Patrick were so impressed, of, uh, by, impressed by Ushio and his art. How Gyucha is great, how Ushio is great, his work is great. <laughs> so then uh, I, sh I, showed, I showed them the, my cutie and pretty comic book, which I was uh, making, and uh, they looked at carefully, it took about an hour, and their face became blue and went home. A few, few months later, uh, Zach filmed all my cutie and booty and turned to the animation. So I think uh, my cutie, my cutie uh, directed Zach. Um, I, can I, add to, I can add to that. Okay, go ahead. Um, just about the idea that the subject, you know, sort of did the subjects have an influence on or demands and sort of, I, I think that you know, the reason, and probably similar to what Joe was saying, but, you know, I was looking for a project where I wouldn't have to deal with the subject that was sort of making demands as to how they were to be um, depicted. And I think, you know, I was looking for subjects that um, hadn't really been exposed in the public eye. And I think also, one of the reasons I liked making a movie about artists is because they understood that what I was doing was a form of art or was it was my own version of their story. There's also a level of trust in just allowing a filmmaker to manipulate your life, which is ultimately what documentary is, and, and make something of it, make something distinct and something that is as much the filmmaker as the subject. And, um, you know, they understood that this, this is what I was doing, and so they weren't constantly sort of, I mean, obviously they were curious, but there was never a feeling of, and, and even when they saw the film, they had specific criticisms, but it was never the feeling that I had to change something. It was more, this is our opinion, but we understand that this is your film, and there are a million ways to make it. So I think that's why I was attracted to making the film about artists. Um, we have to wind up and we'll allow this lady to have the last question, but before we do, I want you guys to have the opportunity to, I know that <clears throat> opportunities are coming up for people to see your film, so we'll just put in a big plug right now. So uh, we'll be at the New York Film Festival October 5th uh, at Alice Tully Hall on Saturday um, at 12 p.m. and October 10th um, here next door at Eleanor Burnett. Um, 
at, or is it here? Anyway, in, at, at Lincoln Center, part of the New York Film Festival, October 10th, Thursday at 3. But we are also releasing theatrically here in New York City, starting October 18th, and we go on a nation. At Lincoln Center tour. and at IFC Cinema. We would like to see your friends there. <laughs> it, it, at, at, be, because uh, the film has sparked this debate on race and, and how to make it part of our er everyday conversation. So, Promise Film is our Twitter handle. Uh, we have, uh, I'm gonna, uh, we, we have developed assets for our parents and we have this nationwide tour which has already begun with students, teachers, and, and parents. Yeah, we've uh, been screening theatrically in New York for three weeks. Uh, we're opening at the Nighthawk in Williamsburg on Thursday. Um, and we'll be on iTunes and Netflix, I think, shortly. Um, and yeah, we also um, we're playing at a couple of, of festivals internationally too. London coming up, and and uh, but yeah, please follow us on on Twitter and Facebook as well. Give us your comments. And if you don't know already, both these films premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, and we're very proud of that. Um, so this lady has a very final question, and we, get it, we need to make it brief because we're past our time. Okay. Um, I just have a short question about the, how you build the trust between, as a filmmaker, with your subjects, and if to get access to their world, to their families, to what's the most intimate, you had to give them access to your own world. So... We just have time for one film to answer your question, so pick one. Uh, shoot you in the book, sir. <laughs> uh, so I think the question is, did I have to sort of open up my life for them to open up theirs? Um, uh, first of all, we artists are uh, kind of exhibitionist. So uh, we are always okay to film us. You know, I always tell at the film festivals Q and the same question, uh, like the Saringa or uh, Jasper Jones. Those celebrated people can stay in in, in the world, but uh, we, uh, like me, emerging artists, have to have a chance to explore myself. So, we uh, filmmaker is welcome. I also think yes, I had to expose myself for them to feel, I mean, it's, you know, it's just a process, it's a friendship, it's a relationship, it's, you know, it's like dating someone or, you know, a relationship with your parents, the, the sort of more you reveal about your life, the more they reveal about theirs. It's it, it, absolutely an essential part of this process. Also for me being, you know, a, a random uh, white guy from Texas doing a film about a Japanese subject that's lived in New York for 40 years. I obviously didn't have, I wasn't, you know, the same kind of contextual frame of mind, uh, even, you know, culturally as them. And, and uh, so there was a, immediately that, you know, probably mistrust there. But, you know, for some reason I kept coming back and back and back and, and sort of forced myself, uh, you know, forced a friendship. Um, you know, in order to, to make the film because I thought that they were just such great people and such great subjects, so. And Michelle has one addendum before we wind up. Yeah, in addition to the theatrical, we are also being aired on PBS on POV at the beginning of next year. So we're very excited about that. So many opportunities to see these great films. Thank you all so much for coming out and let's give it up for our panelists.